Welcome to Healthcare Data Analytics, Unit 4, Communicating Data Analysis Results. The objectives for this unit are to select the best data communication mode given the analysis goals and results, interpret data analysis results, present solutions for a variety of technical data communication challenges, and prepare a simple data visualization as well as design and develop a complex data visualization. When you are talking about communicating your data results for value-based purchasing or population health management or care coordination, there are some basics of communication. The first one is to delineate the problem or delineate the question. What exactly is it that you are trying to communicate? Define your audience. Choose the right mode based on your problem and your audience. Make sure you use the right words. Visuals almost always help because many of us are very visual. Then finally, have an elevator speech. So let's look at each of these in turn. When you delineate the problem or decide what question, it's really about what you are trying to do with this communication. What is the purpose for the communication? Is there a particular time frame involved with this communication? Do you need to do it today, tomorrow, next month, next year? How long does the communication need to last? Today, tomorrow, next month, next year? Does the number of people you are trying to reach matter? You really need to be very clear about your purpose for communicating and what you intend to do with it. That's an important part of delineating the problem. Once you have done that, if you have done that well, hopefully it can help you define your audience. Are you going to be communicating to colleagues or coworkers, staff or supervisors? Are you going to be communicating to the subject matter experts? If that's the case, you will approach it differently. Are you going to be communicating to scientists in other fields? Again, that might change how you communicate. Possibly you are being interviewed by a journalist or you are trying to make a case for particular policymakers. It could be others. You could be doing a presentation to a room full of school children. The audience you are trying to communicate to is very important. But what you are trying to communicate, as well as who you are communicating to, will help you determine what the right mode of communication is. That means, what are the communication channels you are going to use? Now, it could be that you will use all of these in different ways, but you really need to brainstorm what are the possible different communication channels. Some of this is going to depend on your problem and your audience, but it may also depend on the resources available for your communication effort. So, are you going to maybe send out an email blast? Are you going to publish a website or a blog? There are people who feel they reach a larger audience with a blog than if they utilized, say, a peer-reviewed manuscript. All of these channels, and probably more that you can think of, are available if you're trying to communicate your data results. Then, it's very important again to choose the right words for your audience. If it's subject matter experts, or children, or adults, who may not be familiar with your field, you would communicate differently and may use different words with each one of those audiences. You need to be very careful of acronyms. We may be very familiar now with the Office of the National Coordinator, ONC, Electronic Health Record, EHR, or Meaningful Use, MU. However, your audience may not be. So be careful of your acronyms. Also be careful of your jargon, and by this I mean if you are talking about very specific types of things almost using a code the way we talk about it. So just be careful of that. Typically, to have a very clear message, especially if it's to non-scientific people, you will want to use short words and short sentences. 
You may have a vast array of educational levels in an audience, so you want to be sure to use words that everyone can understand. And then finally, be careful of the number of words that you are using, especially if you are creating a data display or if you are trying to communicate results and you are also going to include a data display where maybe the visual is more important and too many words would distract. And typically people don't read too many words if you have got a really good visual. Let's talk a little bit about data visualization. Edward Tufte is well known in the field of visualizations and actually has a book on the visual display of quantitative information. And here we see some of his main points about creating the ideal graph. He contends you need to show the data and you really want them to be thinking about what is reflected in that data rather than the other points of your visual display. Sometimes I have seen very, very colorful displays where the vivid colors take away from the data that's in the display and I'm paying more attention to the colors than I am to what the display is actually trying to tell me. Don't distort what the data have to say so that it's misleading. You can present many numbers in a small space with an ideal graph. It can help to make large data sets coherent and we are going to be looking at a couple of examples in the following slides. It can encourage the eye to compare different pieces of data. Again, we are going to see some examples of that. Sometimes it can also reveal the data at several levels of detail hopefully serve a clear purpose, and if you have done the data visualization well, all of your statistical and verbal descriptions of the data set can be explored with that data visualization. Data visualization is often very necessary when we are talking about communicating our results. So let's look at some of the more common types of data visualizations. We will start with bar charts. Typically, bar charts are used to show comparisons between groups. You may have groups of people, you may have groups of hospitals, groups of providers, groups of physicians, and bar charts can show comparisons between the groups. It can be vertical, also known as column charts, as you see here, or you can put this chart on the side and it can become horizontal. It can be a histogram, which we will look at in the next slide. It can also be a Pareto chart, which is when you have the results starting from the most going down to the least. So bar charts are pretty flexible and there are a lot of different types of bar charts. The example that we see here is from false data, but it's a histogram where race equals white for a given data set. We are looking at the frequency of the different ages. And in this data, you can see the very young was the most frequent. These are the things that a histogram can tell you if it's done correctly. The stacked bar graph that we see here is also false data. And you can see we are looking at student grade distribution. So stacked bar graphs are nice and we will see another example of this. So between year one, year two, and year three, you can see your A's were steadily increasing. And then, all of a sudden, in year four, you had an immediate and really telling decrease. And you don't know why, and your C's really increased. So, stacked bar graphs are nice if you can categorize your data, and each one can equal a 100%. So this is 100% of the students. Line charts are typically used for large amounts of data occurring over time. The most common way we see line charts used in healthcare is for any sort of results over time. So, for example, lab results over time, such as an HbA1c over time or blood pressure readings over time, lend themselves very well, very easily to a line chart. Pie charts or shape charts, because they don't always have to be in a pie shape, Display the data as a proportion of the whole. Well, what does that mean? It means that you have 100% of something and you are going to split it into different categories. So for example, this pie chart here could represent percentage of patients with a particular insurance or payer. So it's the proportion of a whole. 
A pie chart does not have any axis like you find with the bar charts or line chart. It can be any shape, and as you see here on this pie chart, you can explore parts of your pie chart, or you can break it apart for emphasis. Polar or radar charts, such as the one you see here, use multiple series or categories of data. Larger values are further away from the center, and so, if used correctly, this can be a very novel and interesting way to display the data. Scatter plots or scatter charts show your data values presented as a series of points on a chart. You are looking at one here. It can show you the distribution of the data. It can show you any clusters of data. It can be used for displaying and comparing large amounts of numerical data. And this particular scatter plot here the results were reported as a sensitivity or recall scatter plot for computer assisted coding that was tested between 1970 to 2010. The intent was hopefully that you would see over time the sensitivity or recall improved. And instead what you see is still over here in 2010 you have sensitivity and recall that is 30 percent. You do have it also up here in the higher regions, but not all of the study reported a very high sensitivity or recall. There was no clear discernible movement in terms of the sensitivity or recall in the data. Scatter plots are really great to see what's going on if you have very large amounts of data. Let's take a look at display in action. In this instance here, these are some meaningful use EHR results from a publicly available report. And what we see here is they used both the pie chart and they used the stacked bar chart. In the stacked bar chart, we see by physician age the EHR status. You can see clearly if the physician was 40 and under, 72% currently used an EHR. Another 19% plan to implement it versus age 61 where only 46% currently used an EHR. 25% plan to implement, but 29%, more than a quarter, did not plan to implement an EHR. So you can see clearly comparing across the different age groups. And then for the pie chart, you can see whether or not the physician qualified for the EHR incentive payments. This totals 100, and you see 42% do not even know. For practice creating visualizations, you can go to Component 24, Unit 2 for more basic visualization practice and go to Component 24, Unit 10 for more complex visualization practice. Of that list of communication basics, the last step was elevator speech. And the elevator speech is so named because can you tell the story in the time it takes to ride the elevator? Often, this is all of the time you may get to tell someone your message and tell them why it's important to them. So typically, when you are trying to do an elevator speech, you want to make sure that you have no more than three main points, because to go longer would be longer than the elevator ride, and it also becomes very difficult for them to remember. You want to make it very meaningful, again, so they remember it and it sticks with them, and as before, you want to make it easy to understand. So no complex topics, no real complex words, certainly no jargon or acronyms that they might know. It needs to be easy to understand. You should always have an elevator speech if you are trying to communicate an idea multiple times. This concludes Component 24, Healthcare and Data Analytics, Unit 4, Communicating Data Analysis Results. To summarize, effective data communication requires thought and planning. It is not equal for all audiences, so you must know the audience you are communicating with. The visual presentation can be very important, but also more difficult. And it always helps to have an elevator speech or a short description summarizing your communication.